This is a tale out of a southern gothic novel. Greed, jealousy, false trails, envy. It was a fairy tale Cinderella kind of story that's supposed to have a happy end. Lorenzen was an absolute force on the court. He was an instant millionaire. Just as fast as he was making money, money was being spent. And he loved the ladies. The ladies loved him too. It was almost like he was just blind with love. She put moves on him like karate chop that they don't do in Mississippi. She saw a future with a millionaire. And then, out of the blue, Lorenzen Wright went missing. If he's missing, he doesn't want us to know where he is. Developing tonight, a former player disappeared and... We gotta investigate, we gotta investigate. What was your interaction like with the police? I was on them. Check this person out and this person out. I am the mother of Lorenz and Wright. I mean, that's a mother's love for their child. Oh my God, when I heard that story... I didn't know what was going on. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. Is it impossible that his friends, people who knew him and loved him, might not have known about this other side. Georgetown 911, where's your emergency? To actually hear the 911 call, it's blood curdling. And you hear gunshot. You hear that dispatcher say hello over and over again. Hello? Hello? You hear the gunshots and, and, and you hear silence. I don't have nothing but gunshots. That 911 call and what would come after would start a mystery in the city of Memphis that would transfix it for more than a decade. It was the whodunit of all cases in Memphis history. Describe Memphis to me. Great city, great town. Culture is unique. Of course you think of Elvis. Elvis Presley even recorded the song Memphis, Tennessee about his hometown. But I think of the blues. I think of B.B. King, I think of Bill Street. Memphis is the birthplace of the blues and rock and roll. People in Memphis love to talk about the music. What they don't like to talk about as much is the crime. Every time you turn the TV on, you hear of someone being murdered. Three people were shot and one man died. Being robbed. An attempted robbery led to shots being fired. A stab was shot. But the shooting took place on Chestnut. It's an ongoing thing, man. Memphis has always been this city of haves and have-nots. Probably 30 to 40 percent of our people are below the poverty line and Memphis has had its share of crime through the years. These disparities, both racial and economic, they're still there in Memphis. But one thing brings Memphis together, and that's basketball. Basketball bridged a racial divide in Memphis. It's one of those binding things that brings people together from all walks of life. You gotta understand, people from Memphis, they just love whoever plays for them. So imagine if that player is homegrown. Trail by five, dribble drive, left hand, followed by Lorenzen Wright. That love then just becomes off the charts. This is why what happened to Lorenzen Wright was such a big deal. It's why I went there, to really sit down and talk to the people who knew him best. Who is Lorenzen Wright? Lorenzen Wright was one of the best human beings that ever drew breath on this earth. A lot of good basketball players come out of here. He was one who really made it big. It was even noted on TV broadcasts. He come to Memphis as a superstar, so his name was all over the media, it was all over the press. He stood out. He was a hometown hero. My name is Deborah Marion, and I am the mother of Lorenzen Wright. Describe what it was like bringing Lorenzen into this world. Oh, honey, honey, honey. First of all, he was a big child. He couldn't just lay in my lap because he was just too long. So he was so long his head came off your knees? Yes. His mother had him at a very young age, and he was raised by his mother and grandmother within the same home. Lorenzen's mom and dad were never married, and Lorenzen's dad, Herb, didn't live in the family home, but he was still a big part of Lorenzen's life. 
by seventh, eighth grade, he was already playing with the high school team. And that's when they decided to move to get him around better competition. Literally everywhere, they were talking about Lorenzen, even in high school. Yes. So Lorenzo decides that he's going to go to Memphis State. The folks in Memphis love it when Cincinnati comes a-calling. A sellout crowd expected tonight at the Pyramid. Lorenzo drew people to the Coliseum to watch basketball. They didn't know anything about basketball. The entire city was just buzzing with the excitement of him playing for the college. Continues to go to the look at Lorenzen right on the jam. Lorenzo was an absolute force on the court. Exciting. Athletic, big. He loved people. He loved children. He was just a big baby. He was a yes sir, yes ma'am person. He was raised right. That was Lorenzo. He always had that big smile, and that smile would just light you away. It would always get anybody. He was only in Memphis a couple of years before he went to the NBA. Now it's the time for me to accept the challenge of playing with the best basketball players in the nation. That NBA draft was on TV. The Los Angeles Clippers select Lorenzen Wright from the University of Memphis. Memphis just exploded. We were so happy, so joyous. It felt like we all got drafted. We just went crazy. He was an instant millionaire, and the Clippers would make the playoffs in Lorenzen's rookie season. It was definitely life-changing for me. People started calling him the howl, because after he would score or dunk, he would let off this huge howl like he was a wolf howling at the moon. The transition out to California was a very, very big move. Money was no object. It was a culture shock. Memphis is a big city, but it's a big southern city, and it's not like Los Angeles. A few years later, that didn't matter. Lorenzen Wright was going back home. Join me in welcoming Lorenzen Wright. To be able to play high school ball, to play college ball, and then to play in the NBA in front of your hometown, I don't know if it gets any better than that. The whole town is excited to have Lorenzen back, and he shows his gratitude by spreading his wealth around. He is that proverbial guy that would take the shirt off his own back and give it away. He took care of his childhood friends a lot, right? What would he, he do for them? He cars for them and everything, let them stay with him. His house was the spot to hang out in. It was like Disneyland at his house. He had a gigantic pool in the back. The number of bedrooms he had, the entertainment, it was really, really nice. And he purchased his mother a home literally three minutes away. At one point, he buys you a house. What did that feel like for you? Oh, my, look at my baby. Look at my baby. The little shortcut from Lorenzo's house to his mom's house was a little road. Didn't nobody else parent live on one end and a child live on the other. That was our road, our little cut. It's called Callous Cutoff. Callous Cutoff. It's not a road you want to drive down there. No lights. That was a road that if you didn't know it was there, you didn't know it was there. It's in the city, but it actually just feels like you're out in the country. I mean, heavy woods on both sides. If you're driving, you just want to drive on through it. You don't want to stop. Lorenzen had driven that shortcut maybe hundreds of times, and nothing had ever happened. He probably never thought for a moment that it might be dangerous. And then, out of the blue, Lorenzen Wright went missing. Police have joined in the search for missing NBA player Lorenzen Wright as his family is starting to fear the worst. This is a millionaire. He's a basketball player. If he's missing, he doesn't want us to know where he is. It was a fairy tale Cinderella kind of story that's supposed to have a happy ending. That was the biggest mistake he ever made in his life. <laughs> I think Lorenzen Strick came from the worth ethic that his father instilled in him. On the court, he was a beast. <laughs> Off the court, he was just a meek and mild individual. So really, basketball was Lorenzen's entire life, really. Lorenzen met his wife through basketball. Cheryl came into the picture his junior year of high school. He met her over the summer. 
playing AAU basketball, and her dad was his coach. Golden brown skin, beautiful smile. She looked really good, very sexy. She was easy on the eyes. I don't think he had never, ever came in contact with anyone that looked like Sherrod. I mean, she had all the goods. We would say she knew she was fine and you didn't have to tell her. There is a discrepancy about exactly when they started dating. Depending on who you talk to, she was in college when he was in high school. He's a junior in high school, and here he is dating a junior in college, you know? He thought he was big time then. They became friends, stayed in contact, and a few years later, that's when the relationship went from a friendship to a romantic relationship. It was almost like he was just blind with love, right? Yes. Yeah, that girl, crazy. She put moves on him like karate chop that they don't do in Mississippi. I was hearing that, that Cheryl was wanting to get pregnant and to marry Lorenzo. Assuming that he was going to be this great NBA basketball player. When she saw Lorenzo, she saw a future with a millionaire. Some of the people closest to Lorenzo see Sheriff as a gold digger. So, were you concerned? Very. He was listening on us, and I kind of like cooled down because I said, if I gotta like her a little bit, you know, to keep my son close to me. You didn't try to disrupt the relationship because he loved her. Exactly. Deborah and Cheryl, they never got along. These two, they never liked each other. When she got pregnant, he was excited about it. You know, obviously his parents wasn't. I don't think this was a situation where she was chasing Lorenzo and eventually wore him down to be with her. I think, if anything, it was the other way around. So while we're in college doing the fraternity thing, she was about to give birth to Lorenzo Jr. at the time. In between class and practice time, he would go see his baby. Some of his friends and family feel that Shara has trapped him. She knew once she had a child, it was over, marriage, because he wanted to be in the house with his child. And at that point, you knew that she was going to get married to him. Yes. It was a couple years later after they got married. Of course, he had always told us that he wanted a big family. As Lorenzen's NBA career blossoms, so does his family. He has a son, Lorenzen Jr., a daughter, Lauren, twins, Lamar and Shamar, Sophia, Lawson, and a daughter, Sierra, who died tragically of SIDS. That could take a toll on any marriage, even a good one. Family was everything to him. For Lorenzen, his kids was everything to him. Um, he spent his whole life and everything he valued was based on his kids and love for his kids. What were those early days in the NBA? What was the marriage like between Sharon and Lorenzo? Uh, it was good. The two of them were living well together. They were getting along. Yes. For an NBA player in a marriage, there's good news and bad news. The good news, you're making millions of dollars to support your wife and your family. They had money. They had money, and they could go and buy things. And he loved cars, and she loved jewelry. And, uh, you know, they spent a lot of money. Just as fast as he was making money, money was being spent. The bad news, you're on the road a lot, and that comes with temptations. He's a ladies' man. He loved the ladies. The ladies loved him, too. And he would tell me every time the plane touched down, they'd be already there waiting. They were always trying to connect, trying to find out where the hookup places would be after the game. Now, do I know that he cheated? Yes, hell, I know. I was with him half of the time. When did they start struggling and why? When he caught her with that guy. He caught her being unfaithful. Yes. And that's when things started breaking down. Yes. The infidelity happened, to be fair, on both sides. So the marriage was complicated. I think what happened to the marriage was that, you know, they grew apart. Maybe there were some, some greed issues there. He would say things like, man, it's just always about money with her. Did they have a lot of fights? I've seen the evidence of some pretty bad problems.
told me the marriage ended because he didn't trust Cheryl anymore. She felt the same about him, but they were still going to try to find a way to raise these kids. At that point, how was his relationship with his kids? Fine. He said this. Cheryl is the one who filed for the divorce, not Lorenzo. But he was not going to fight for it because he wanted it over with as well. The post-divorce life between Cher and Lorenzen Wright appeared to be routine until that one July day when he went missing. At that point, we said bye. They get out of the car, I drive away, and that's the last time I see my friend. Georgetown 911, where's your emergency? And when police would begin to pull back the curtain on Lorenzen's private life, the city of Memphis would learn some troubling new stories about its hometown hero. There's another side to Lorenzen that you all don't know about. It's the summer of 2010. Lorenzo Wright is living in Atlanta with his buddy, Mike G. When Lorenzo and Cheryl were divorced, he um, ended up moving to Atlanta. So I went and moved in on with him, and you know we just had a good time. By this time, his NBA playing days are over. But what's not over, apparently, is his relationship with his ex. Even though Shara and Lorenzo were divorced, they had certainly a physical relationship they still had an intimate relationship. But it was more than just sex. People who know them say they were still in love and were even thinking of starting over. Lorenzen did propose to Shara after they were divorced. The children saw him ask her to marry him, and Shara had said yes. So on this one particular weekend that summer, Lorenzen's coming back to Memphis to visit. Shara calls him and asks him to go to a dance recital for their daughter, Lauren. And it turns out his sister, Denotra, is having a baby shower that weekend, too. So he's got a lot going on. I drove Lorenzo to the airport and the flower to Memphis. As I look back and now, I think that something was going on, because Lorenzo was, he was always on edge that whole week, which I thought was unusual. Whenever Lorenzo came to Memphis, Phil would be the first person that he would call completely unexpected, out of the blue. He calls me and says, hey, bud, uh, I'm in town. Uh, let's hang out. Just bought a new vehicle, and I wanted him to ride in it. And we rode all around the city. He took a picture on my phone of himself that evening. To look at that photo, you would never know that Lorenz and Wright's life was in serious danger. Just after 10 p.m. on this hot July evening, temperatures just now dropping below 90 degrees. Doesn't look like we're going to have any relief in sight. This is Tim Van Horn, and you're listening to WREC. Just a few hours later, a 911 call comes into the nearby town of Germantown, Tennessee. Germantown is just east of Memphis. It's one of the smaller municipalities right outside of Memphis. It's a very short call, and you hear a, a desperate voice on there. You hear a series of gunshots. Georgetown 911, where's your emergency? Hello? 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 I don't have nothing but gunshots. There's no caller ID, so the dispatcher doesn't know where the call is coming from specifically. They thought this call was a hang-up. There was no follow-up. Operator picks up the phone. Georgetown 911, where's your emergency? And you hear gunshots. Hello? To me, that calls for immediate response. Like, you leave it alone. You leave it alone? For our report, 2020 reached out to the Germantown Police Department to ask why they didn't immediately follow up on that 911 call. They declined to speak with us, 
But at the time, a department review concluded that dispatchers properly followed procedures. It was an opportunity lost. <laughs> because on that call is the last time anybody would hear Lorenzen's voice. I probably called him four or five times that night. And I texted him about three or four times. And I just really figured that, you know, maybe he had fallen asleep. He was supposed to be coming to the baby shower. I kept calling him all that day, and he didn't answer the phone. Well, I was getting married July 20th in the Virgin Islands, and so he said that he was going to come over and, and, and be my best man. I get a phone call from one of my other great friends saying, hey, man, Lorenzen is missing. His friends weren't really concerned in the beginning because that's that, that was just Lorenzen. It's like still living that NBA life. Those guys, they'd hop on a plane and go to Vegas. Not hearing from him, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't out of the norm. But when Lorenzo's mother found out that he wasn't even calling his daughter Lauren back, that was too much for her. She filed a missing persons report. When I first got the news, I got a phone call. Did you hear that Lorenzo was missing? Initially, I was not alarmed. I'm thinking, if he's missing, he doesn't want us to know where he is. It's on purpose. I became concerned when I saw the concern in her face and in her voice. When that missing persons report is made officially known, it becomes a major news story. Developing tonight, a former player for both the Memphis Tigers and the Grizzlies has disappeared, and now his family is worried about his safety. Talk just spread all over Memphis. Where's Lorenz and what's going on? So the Memphis Police Department starts a missing persons investigation. When somebody goes missing, you have to look at their circumstances at the time. They look at their inner circle. Is anybody new? Did they owe anybody any money? What was Lorenzen's financial condition after basketball? It was not good. Uh, it was not good at all, and, and that really affected him greatly. Lorenzen Wright made as much as $55 million playing basketball. But because he and Cheryl were spending like crazy, there actually wasn't that much left. So to compensate, he always had some side businesses. I think he was doing the side businesses just to, you know, try to create other streams of income for when he did retire. He wants to invest in something else, have other things going on, you know? His dad ran his uh, sports cafe for him. He also had a car detailing shop. Among those off-the-court business relationships, there would be one relationship that would come back to haunt Lorenzen Wright, a man named Bobby Cole. Bobby Cole was a high-level drug dealer. How would Lorenzen be connected to a drug dealer? But Cole was not only a drug dealer, he was also a race car driver. And Lorenzen, as it turned out, loved cars. At some point, they meet, and Cole agrees to buy two of Lorenzen's cars. I remember him telling me, man, I sold the guy my cars. Now, what the guy was doing, I did not know. The feds had actually looked into this long before Lorenzen Wright disappeared to see if any of his transactions with Bobby Cole involved drugs or drug money. And the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, actually investigated that connection, interviewed Bobby Cole. They didn't find any connection. But those drug rumors would actually start swirling again, this time when police interviewed his ex-wife, Shara. She also told law enforcement that about six weeks earlier, she had gotten a visit from some unknown individuals that wanted to do Lorenzo some harm. Shara Wright, in talking to investigators, claims that she saw Lorenzo leaving with a man she didn't know, carrying a box with drugs. Kind of painting this portrait of a guy who's troubled, who's lost all his money. He's trying to make money illegally. Is it impossible that people who knew him and loved him might not have known about this other side that involved drugs? Well, it's possible, but he told me about everything that he was dealing with. And I believe that if he had been doing that, I believe he would have told me. This whole idea that he was involved in drugs, what did you make of that? Y'all don't want me to say what I want to say. But the police are on the brink of a breakthrough. The investigation made a dramatic turn when Memphis police found out about that Germantown 911 call. That revelation eventually leads investigators to that desolate road 
the callous cutoff, the shortcut from Lorenzen's house to his mom's. And there, they will make a chilling discovery. Since I've been grown, I've been strong and tall. I ain't ever met nobody that could keep me on a bar hole. Lorenzen Wright's disappearance was all over Memphis TV. Lorenzen Wright has not been seen since Sunday. One local news crew even got his ex-wife, Shara, to come to the door. He was fine. And he's fine now, and I can't, I'm not gonna believe anything other than that he's fine now. In those days after Lorenzen went missing, his friends are all trying to come up with plausible explanations as to where Lorenzen might be, that maybe he is fine. But there's one thing that keeps coming up, one thing that sticks out when they think back about the night he disappeared. In the hours after Lorenzen took that selfie in his friend's car, they remember that Lorenzen and Shara had a fight. That evening, Phil and Lorenzen had been planning a father-son night with their boys. But suddenly, Lorenzen gets a call from Shara, and it was unpleasant. I can hear Shara say, no, no, you bring him home now. He was like, all right, okay, all right, fine. I don't want to argue with you. And so we drove on to the house. Yeah, he was dropped off at Shara's house. He was just going to go see his Go see Shara. And when we pull up at the house, he said, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to calm her down. And I'll call you later. And then we can go out. So Phil drives away, having no clue that this is the last time he'll see his friend. Because a few hours later, <laughs> Georgia 911, where is your emergency? That 911 call, which might not have been investigated then. But it is now. Nine days after Lorenzen went missing, police are all over it. The call was revealed because um, they went back and checked their records, and they found that they had this, this desperate call from the man, you know, nine days earlier. Once the 911 supervisors realized that there was a call made on that night, they did a triangulation and, and found the area that the call was made from. It's a rural area, a wooded area, not a lot of traffic. And when police visit that wooded area, their worst fears are realized. They find the body. Police in Memphis, Tennessee, have found the body of former NBA player Lorenzen Wright. Of course, it was a huge story on the local news. They found him almost instantly. His body was found. There wasn't much left of it because it, it had been out there nine days. Even if you knew Lorenzen well, there was no way in the world that you could have identified his remains as, as him. The condition of his body was shocking, that he had literally melted in the hot summer sun. The 6 foot 11, 255 pound NBA center was just 57 pounds when his body was found. Badly decomposed, investigators say he was shot at least five times. When did you find out that he was dead? When they found his body. When I got that phone call, you know, I just threw down the phone and just broke down, you know? It was really, really, it was really painful. Me and my girlfriend jumped in her car and flew over there so quick. I was trying to get down there where he was because I wanted to walk his last step. But me and him was like this. So you went to the crime scene. It was as if you wanted to find a clue. Right. By literally walking in his footsteps. Yes. You could see a mother's anguish in real time as news cameras capture her desperation to see her son. Lorenzen Wright's mother was ushered behind the crime tape by MPD investigators. She was visibly upset but did not speak to the media before leaving the scene. They had her on the news. Where's my baby? Screaming out, where's my baby? Did the police let you get into the crime scene? They let that fall a little bit, but they won't let me get all the way where he was. They let me get under the tape. They, well, they, I, they, I went under the tape anyway. Of course, they tried to stop me. Did you see your son? Nope. I, they won't let me get that far. This area is woodsy. It's quiet. It's really remote. 
That area was also not very far from that shortcut where Lorenzen Wright once lived near his mother, the Callus Cutoff. The Callus Cutoff? That was a shortcut Lorenzen had taken hundreds of times. It's a strange place for his body to show up. Is it a clue? No one was concentrating on it in that moment. No one was talking about the fact that, you know, that he lived nearby. The body turning up there, does it narrow the scope of people who were involved in it, or does it widen it? It's still very hard to tell. Publicly, yeah, there was a lot of talk about other people being involved. You talked to people and asked, did you know anybody, any reason why anybody would want to hurt Lorenzen? Was he involved in illegal activity? They also found shell casings and actual bullets. Turns out police found shells from two different caliber weapons. This is a critical piece of evidence. It means that more than one gun was used in the shooting. Lorenzo was shot five times, but he was shot with two different guns. So we got another shooter. But then it got really real to us that he's gone. Somebody has killed Lorenzo. I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, who could have killed my friend? Why would somebody want him to die? The answers wouldn't come quickly. In fact, it would take a book written five years later to shed new light on the case. A book written by none other than Shara herself. And then this book comes out, which almost appears to give clues. Lorenzen Wright. Lorenzen's funeral was a, almost an, a state affair here in Memphis. It was held at FedEx Forum, a place where he once played basketball as an NBA player. And now it was where thousands of people came out to mourn the loss of their hometown hero. They put together a, a beautiful ceremony. His pledge brothers, we were all pallbearers for, for, the, for the funeral. I was uh, asked to do the eulogy. His smile was infectious, his work ethic unmatched, his generosity prolific, and his commitment unswervering. The thing that I remember the most about the funeral is Shara hugging me and saying thank you for such a beautiful eulogy. Ren would have loved that. It was such a tragic situation, seeing his kids suffer like that knowing they'll never see their father again. This tragic moment, that funeral, it morphs into this, you know, who done it? Because no one knew who did it. At the beginning of a case, you have to remain objective and you have to let the evidence lead you. You have to prepare yourself to be surprised sometimes. This is now essentially a cold case because nine days have passed, a body has been in sweltering heat, which degrades evidence tremendously. The killers had a nine-day head start on us. There were no witnesses, so this was not an easy case at all. Because in these kinds of things, you know, the spouse is always a suspect. They're looking at Shara hard. My number one suspect was the person that I hear everybody else talking about, was Shara. You were suspicious of Shara at this point? Yes. OK, did you tell the police? Yes. What did they say to you? We got to investigate. We got to investigate. We thought she was being forthcoming with information, and in the midst of that, she chose to lawyer up. Lawyering up may not look good, but it doesn't mean she had anything to do with the man's murder. You need evidence if you're going to arrest someone. And so far, there is no evidence that points to Shara. And she denies involvement on a local interview. If I knew who did this to Lorenza, you would know who did this to Lorenza. When Shara was not arrested, like, well, maybe she didn't do it. They started thinking about, well, OK, what about the drug thing? You know, maybe that went wrong some kind of way. They were absolutely looking for guys who had come into Memphis, hit men, to kill Lorenzen. And that just didn't make any sense at all. If a guy owes you a lot of money, what point is it killing him? You'll never get your money back by killing him. We did look into it. I mean, if the ex-wife is telling us this, we have to investigate it. What was your interaction like with the police? I was on them. How often did you go down there? Every day. Every day. 
saying, I want you guys to get on this and find his killer. And this person did this and check this person out and this person out. It was say, the mama bears take care of their cubs. She was relentless in her pursuit of justice for him. Not to let her son's life and legacy just go down the drain. I mean, that's a mother's love for their child. Deborah Marion says she'll keep fighting until her son's killers are held accountable. I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to give up. Every anniversary of his murder, she did a candlelight vigil. Deborah Marion says the vigil is for family, friends, and the public to come together and remember Lorenzen. Every birthday, she would release balloons at his gravesite. My son ain't did nothing to nobody to be murdered. But all of Deborah's efforts aren't making any difference. For years, the police don't arrest anyone, and Shara seems to have moved on with her life. After his death, she became more involved in the church that she had already been a part of and did actually become a pastor in that church. To me, of course, my own prejudice admitted she was no preacher. Her lifestyle had not changed. And she was just always after the money. The people who want to accuse Cher of being involved in Lorenzen's murder point to the fact that she did receive a million dollar payout from his life insurance policy. Shara ended up in a long, protracted legal battle with Lorenzen's father, Herb, and he claimed that she was spending money on extravagant items and not on the children. I didn't work from the time we separated. She was buying fancy cars and it got pretty dirty, you know, it was all of them in court, you know, fighting over the money. That's common for family members to fight over proceeds and, and, and to end up in court. So that didn't have uh, any significant impact on the case. But an investigator never knows when something odd will come up. And in this case, something odd and unexpected does come up. Shara writes a book. Cheap dime store novel type of book that is very curious, has a lot of clues about, you know, what happened. The book is called Mr. Tell Me Anything. It's the story of a woman who has a tumultuous marriage with an NBA player. It's supposed to be fictitious, but it doesn't seem that way. It's almost like a confession that falls short of fully confessing, and she wants publicity. So I interviewed her in July of 2015 for about an hour and a half. Sure, I'm going to need you to speak up because I'm worried about the background noise. Commercial appeal reporter Mark Paraskia conducts an extensive interview with Shara at a restaurant called J. Alexander's. It's a busy, trendy restaurant chain in Memphis. Let me ask you this, Shara. The book, why did you write it? What are you hoping to accomplish? A marriage, I mean, you go through your ups and downs. I just believe that when the downs become more overwhelming and there's more downs than ups, then that's the time to um, kind of go back in and see which one outweighs um, the other. In the interview, Shara explains that the NBA player depicted in the book is abusive, not just verbally, but physically. And she claims the character is based on Lorenzo. Lorenzo had a problem with keeping his hands to himself. Uh, or Mr. Tell Me Anything, this character did. Um, and I, I grew him from Lorenzo. Like, I produced him from experiences with Lorenzo. And so, um, yeah, he had a problem with that. You're planning a sequel, too, right? If I, if I read that right. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> when is that coming out? It's 90% done. It's going to take you all the way up to Mr. Tell Me Anything's death and just a little bit. Mr. I mean, I don't want to give away your book, but does Mr. Tell Me Anything Murder? Oh, yes, he is. That was a kind of chilling moment in the recording. But see, it gives Paraskia an invitation to ask about the real life circumstances surrounding Lorenzen's death. Any idea who, who, who did this? Or... I don't know. She missed her husband. She wanted them to find her, the killers and that there's no reason for anybody to suspect her. Did you have anything to do with his murder or his disappearance? I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm an author, and the police should find his killer. For my name to be even in the same sentence or something like that, I'm a minister of the Lord, and I've never been in any type of trouble or anything. I, I just, I. I'm a mother, an author, and a wife. She 
she just flat denies it. To me, she had the, the you know, was very convincing. But Shara would soon appear very convincing to another reporter who comes to do a story on her. His name is Kelvin Cowens, and he's about to commit a cardinal sin for a professional journalist. Now, so she's tall, she's beautiful, I'm in trouble. We started dating immediately. Kelvin Cowens may believe he's found true love, just as a Memphis dive team finds something critical at the bottom of this lake.